we're finally here. Hi, I'm Hanod and welcome. We have finally reached the finish line of a marathon that you and I both regret participating in. And you may be wondering, what exactly is the name of this marathon that you are talking about, Hanood? And that marathon is called Fifty Shades of Grey. Yes, as you saw by the title, this video is about the final installation of the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy, Fifty Shades Freed. I originally did not want to make a video about this movie because I thought if the first two were bad, uh, this one must be terrible. But I thought, hey, I started this journey, so I might as well just see where it ends, you know? Just get it over and done with. Satisfy my curiosity. This movie took me so long to process. Weeks after watching the movie and gathering my final thoughts and re-evaluating my life choices, I am now making a video about it. So, without any further ado, without wasting anybody else's time but my own, here is my thoughts feelings and opinions about the final, final film of Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades Freed. So the movie begins with Anna and Christian Grey getting married. Because if you recall, Anna and Christian Grey got married in the previous movie. Also, by the way, I have made videos on the first two movies. So if you want to check them out, they'll be linked somewhere. But yes, in this movie, first thing happens, they get married. There is a honeymoon montage that's not very important because it is cut short since someone had attempted to blow up Christian Grey's company building thing. I don't know. Which by the way, we still don't know what he does as like a businessman or whatever he does. We just know that he is a businessman who does business things and you that's not at all shady. Stop questioning it. They come to find out through surprisingly very clear security footage that Hyde, the creepy rapey dude from the previous movie, was the one behind this attempted terrorist attack. He is out for revenge. As a result of this discovery, Christian Grey hires two bodyguards for Anna and tells her that after work, she should just come straight home and do nothing else. Remember that detail. Also, briefly speaking about Anna working, she works at the publishing company that she was working out at in the previous movie, if you recall. And slight rant here, but when she comes back after her honeymoon and all of the events and Harley showing up to work and blah, 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 she got promoted. What? What is it with these fan fiction writers just rewarding minimal work with great reward? I... I am still speechless. If you saw my after video, Tessa was promoted after like a day of an internship. Anna in these movies showed up to work for like a week and she disappeared for I don't know how long, never doing any work. And then suddenly she's promoted to fiction editor. Why? Why is that a thing? First of all, why is publishing houses a dream career for these people? And second of all, why are they constantly promoted? Why are they even promoted? Is this like, <clears throat> I am telling you, it's a fantasy for these people. It is a fantasy. Anna Todd, E.L. James, fan fiction fantasy. I am telling you. Anyways, while all of this psycho stalker drama is going on, Anna and Christian Grey finally have the will they, won't they have kids conversation. And by the way, while I was re-watching this scene on YouTube and like checking out the comments, 
a lot of people were pointing out the fact that they should have had this conversation before they got married because of course it is a very important conversation and for that point i want to say i agree i wanted to bring up that point because that's just such a weird thing to do to have the kids or no kids conversation after you get married even though it's the main reason why a lot of people get married i don't know i i thought that was a really good point and i wanted to bring it up anyway whatever move on let's just follow the movie's logic now christian gray doesn't want to have children yet because he wants to adjust to married life and spend as much alone time as he can with anna before jumping into the responsibilities of parenthood because of course, as everyone knows, kids take a lot of time and effort and responsibility and parents don't get a lot of time to spend alone together. That made no sense. But you get what I mean. Wait, wait, no, that's not what he said. He does not want to have kids yet because I quote, I am not ready to share you with anyone. Not yet. Remember, he's talking about their future children. Keep this quote in the back of your minds. Anyways, uh, let's forget about family drama now because we're back to the psycho stalker storyline again. I know, very disorienting. One day, Anna decides to go out for drinks with her roommate friend, from the first movie. And before you feel bad for forgetting about her, do not worry because I forgot about her too. While they're out, Anna finds out through this roommate friend of hers that not only is Hyde plotting against her and Christian Grey, but he is also stalking and gathering information on the rest of his family because again, I forgot about this too. The roommate friend is dating Christian Gray's brother and Christian Gray had beefed up his security. So of course she would know about this stuff. Through this, we find out, we and Anna, find out that Hyde is actually a bigger threat than we had previously thought, what Anna previously thought. So after this night out with her friend finishes, she goes back home. And it turns out that Hyde had managed to break into the apartment. So while he's there, he tries to kidnap Anna. Her bodyguards swoop in to save the day. Yay, bodyguards. The police arrive and arrest Hyde. If you were wondering, Christian Grey was out of the city on a business trip and he came back. And for some reason, he's mad at Anna. So he gives her the silent treatment. But eventually, he breaks this silent treatment and takes her down to his stupid ass sex dungeon and starts teasing her with a vibrator. Ties her up BDSM style and starts teasing her. You may think, oh, this is just a regular sex scene, you know, like what they always do. But, however, he is using this opportunity to kind of punish Anna for disobeying him. It's not the, ooh, sexy kind of punishment. No, like an actual punishment. Like he wants to punish her for some reason. So Anna pretty quickly figures this out and uses her safe word, covers herself up and is like, what the f what the f is wrong with you? He starts lecturing her about disobeying him and saying stuff about how he was so worried for her and how he had a nightmare of her dying, blah, 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 I don't care. And then after she asks him why Hyde is gathering information on his family. And to that question, he just says, uh -huh. And that's the end of that. Remember when I said that Hyde was arrested after he broke into apartment and literally tried to kidnap Anna? Well, for some reason, the judge had granted him bail. And of course, Anna is understandably upset by this. And on the same day of 
finding out that he is going to be released, her attacker is going to be released, she goes to the doctors and finds out that she is pregnant. <laughs> Talk about sensory overload, if you know what I mean. She tells Christian Grey and he takes her into his arms and tells her that everything's going to be okay and that they'll work things out together. Psych! He, again, for whatever reason, he gets mad at her as if, as if he had no part in getting her pregnant at all. The odd death. He starts yelling at her like, I was ready to give you the world. Do you really think that I'm ready to be a father? I don't want to figure things out. Blah, 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 blah. And he storms out. We later find out that he left to go have drinks with his former abuser from the previous movie, Elena, or the movie likes to call her his former mistress. I don't agree with that title, but okay. So he comes back home, drunk off his ass. Anna finds out that he went out with Elena from a text that Elena sent Christian Grey, right? And finally, finally, Anna gets angry at Christian. She finally gets mad at him. The next day, when she's getting ready for work, she cusses him out for essentially leaving her to be with his former mistress or abuser, as I like to call her. She tells him to grow up and take responsibility for not only his child, but also, yeah, Justin, just his child. I don't know why, where I was going. Anyway, to take responsibility or else she will leave him to raise the child by herself. You know, he's, she's threatening to leave him essentially. Now, back to high. <laughs> this, this movie is way too long. He calls Anna and informs her that he kidnapped Rita Ora, Christian Grey's sister. Her name is Mia, but I don't, care enough to actually call her Mia. So Rita Ora she is. He wants $50,000 in cash in two hours of the phone call in exchange for the singer. She brings him the money. He ignores it and beats the out of her. She shoots him in the leg. The police arrive and arrest him. She goes to the hospital. While she's at the hospital, Christian Grey visits her and it's all like, I was mad at you for being pregnant because I'm scared of being a bad father. And Anna is all like, don't worry, Christian. Our kids are going to love you unconditionally, just like you love your mother. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Anna, no. That is, Anna, that is not a good thing. Not a good thing at all. We're getting close to the end of the movie, okay? Just, we're getting close, okay? Just bear with me, bear with me for a second. Christian Grey finds out that at some point in time, he and Hyde had shared a foster home together. And the reason why Hyde was plotting against Christian was because he felt that Christian Grey had stolen the life that he wanted because of the fact that he was adopted into the Grey family. And he also wanted revenge on Anna for getting him fired from his previous job. In my personal opinion, I think both motives are stupid as hell, but whatever. Psycho stalker movies don't have to make sense. They visit his dead biological mom's grave. There is a montage of various scenes from all three movies with Love Me Like You Do by Ellie Goulding playing over it, which by the way is still a pretty banger song. They're about to get freaky. And that, my friends, is the end of the Christian Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy. God, this movie is so tiring. Even recounting it now is just, has just exhausted me. This movie was just a roller coaster 
to go through and like not even in a good way. I was strapped into my seat like a second ago and I already want to get off the ride. What is this movie? It's been several weeks and I'm still like, what was that? This movie has two main plot lines. You have the sexy romance story that you would expect from Fifty Shades of Grey, but you also have the psycho stalker storyline. Now I say that there were two main plot lines, as in both storylines are treated with like equal what's the word? Equal importance, let's say. I know that's probably not the best way to describe it, but yeah, equal importance. They're both treated equally, which means the psycho stalker story is not like a side plot to the main story. No, it is a main plot line. And because the psycho stalker aspect of this movie was not secondary to the main plot line of this movie, which was the sexy romance thing. This movie has a tendency to kind of switch between the two. This switch is so abrupt that it makes this movie very disorienting to watch. And also it makes it very exhausting to watch. As a result of this disorientation and exhaustion, as I'm watching this movie, I just don't care about anything that happens in it. I did not care about Anna's roommate's engagement to Christian Grey's brother. I did not care about Rita Ora getting kidnapped by this crazy psycho stalker person guy. I did not care about anything. I just wanted this movie to end. This movie just consists of filler scenes in order to create some space between the sex scenes. That's all there is to it. I mean, that's the whole trilogy, I get that, but like it is most apparent with this one. The writers of this movie, or the creators, I should say, I, I don't know who was responsible. <laughs> they did not care about integrating a, sci a psycho stalker storyline into the main plot line while making it like comprehensible for their audience to watch. I suspect that they were just so tired of making this series that they just wanted to just get straight into the nasty, dry ass sex scenes and they just were like okay just throw in whatever into the like just throw in the events of the novel into the movie and like be done with it you know they did not care about like making it at least bearable to watch i mean as trash as 50 shades darker was at least like they did the psycho stalker storyline better than this movie at least I could follow Fifty Shades Darker without getting severe whiplash, <laughs> you know what I mean? On the topic of the previous movies, Fifty Shades Freed has a rather annoying habit of just completely ignoring information from the previous movies. What I mean by that is that this movie adds information that either is completely new to the series or contradicts what happens in the previous movies. Like for example, Anna gets pregnant in this movie, right? I've mentioned this. The doctor and Christian Grey make it a huge deal that she has not been taking her birth control, which is the injection. I would like to remind you that the last mention of birth control in this trilogy, in the whole trilogy, is in the first movie in the contract that Christian Grey gave Anna to read over. If you recall correctly, she did not sign the contract. And another fact that you should know is she broke up with him at the end of that movie. Sorry for the outfit change. I, uh, it was getting very hot in here, so please 
bear with me for a moment. Anyways, back to what I was saying about the whole birth control situation. I would have to assume that since the first movie, that she has not been taking birth control, right? And also, there was no mention in, of birth control in the second movie either, which again, just reaffirmed my assumption that she was not taking birth control. Now, in the third movie, around an hour in, all of a sudden, she's taking birth control, and all of a sudden, it's such a huge deal to the characters of the movie. Like, where, like, where did this importance come from? And you're probably sitting there thinking, I know, you should have just assumed that she was taking birth control. After all, they do have a lot of sex, so that makes the most sense to just assume. And yeah, you're probably right. Maybe I should have assumed that. But I feel like if you're going to make such a small detail, such a big deal to the characters, I feel like you should have dedicated some time to establish its importance and why it's so important. I mean, in Fifty Shades Darker, they could have had a scene of Anna in a doctor's office and them discussing discussing birth control options and that scene doesn't have to be so long it could be like a minute long just to establish that she needs to be on birth control and that it's a big deal to her and christian gray but did they do this to kind of foreshadow the events of the final movie no they did not they just sprung this information onto us and just ex expected us to know that this like oh, they just act like as if it was already established when no it was not established at all and also this was not the only time in which they had sprung information on on us as if like oh you knew that right you knew that the whole time there is this one part this is so minor this is so nitpicky but there's this one part where they go on vacation to, I don't remember, but they go on vacation with his siblings, right? And he goes on the piano and he starts singing. This fact was so baffling that even his siblings were like, wait, what, what, he sings? And Anna's just standing there like, oh, he always sings when he plays the piano. And I'm just sitting here like, no, he does not. We saw him play the piano in like the previous two movies and he's never sang he sung saying i don't he's he never sings why is he singing that's just lazy writing why is there like they couldn't be bothered with giving a substantial anything you know that's just lazy anyways enough about plot let's now move on to our main heartthrob of not only this movie, but of the whole trilogy, Christian Grey. You know we have to talk about him. The trilogy is named after him, so of course we have to talk about him. Now, the first thing I want to do is kind of answer the question of, I wrote it down. What was E.L. James, the author of this story, visualizing when she created the character of Christian Grey. As we all have established, this movie, or I should, should I say, this story, is a Twilight fan fiction. I am never going to let that go. So, we have Edward Cullen as the inspiration of our main heartthrob, which, um, <laughs> that should tell you enough already, but Let's continue. Add that to shady businessman and sex connoisseur, and the end result should be an intimidating, sexy, BDSM alpha male. Remember, that is the vision of Christian Grey, okay? Just keep this vision in the back of your minds. Now, in the first two movies, I did find him intimidating. I did not find him intimidating as in like, ooh, he's so mysterious and sexy, ooh. Like, no, that was not, 
That was not what I found at all. I found him intimidating as in this man is going to attack me at any given second. And I need to prepare myself for when that moment happens. So when you think about it, they did do the job. They just didn't do it right. That was the previous two movies, right? But for some reason, in this movie, I did not get the fight or flight response thing that I usually get whenever he came on screen. Well, except for the part where he starts yelling at Anna for being pregnant and be like, oh, you think I'm ready to be a father, blah, blah, blah. Like that scene genuinely upset me. But other than that scene, throughout the whole movie, all I saw was just a pathetic, little bitch with <laughs> a very fragile ego who is just trying so desperately to be the alpha male of his dreams. Like this guy probably looks at men like Jason Momoa. He tells himself, how can I be a version of Jason Momoa. I did not see the intimidating serial killer who could probably turn me into a wallet anywhere in this movie. Like, did he like die or something? Like, I was just wondering. I mean, that that's good that he died, but where is he? He's, it's not consistent, you know? Like, where was the intimidating factor from the previous movies? I mean, I know they didn't do it right, but they still did it. There is a scene in this movie in which they're in a club and, you know, a creepy dude is getting all touchy and feely with Anna. Anna slaps him across the face and runs into the arms of Rita Ora. That sounds like a better movie than this one. And you would think that, okay, she slapped the guy. They'll probably just like dance away from him or go back to their table and just try to forget that the whole thing happened. And that would be the end of that, right? Um. Not to Christian Grey. <laughs> With no prompting or anything, he just had to come in and push the guy and be like, hey, alpha male posturing or whatever the hell he's doing. They get into a little fight, which unfortunately Christian Grey wins. Or not unfortunately, the dude was creepy. And his brother, for some reason, is like, Oh, you should see him when he's angry, dude. Anna is over there, like, all hot and bothered and being like, Oh, Christian is so protective of me. Like, when I saw that scene, I was like, what the hell is this? What, what did I watch? What part of that was like, that... That scene did not have to happen, but for some reason it happened. <laughs> Why? By the way, this whole alpha male posturing thing that Christian Grey does happens throughout the whole movie. You know, it's not just that one club scene. It, for some reason, they just had to include it in every aspect of the movie, which they can. Which brings me on to my next point. As disorienting and exhausting as this movie was to watch, I will say it is unintentionally hilarious. Comedy gold. All of its hilarity is because of Christian Grey and his fragile ego, alpha male, toxic masculinity posturing. <laughs> that is what makes this movie <laughs> so funny to watch. Every time his like alpha male started to come through, in all scenes by the way, it just gave me the image of, you know when like a 12 year old boy is trying to act all tough and masculine 
in order to impress his crush but it's clearly not working but like no one wants to tell him that it's not working so he just looks stupid and cringy while he's doing it. That was the image that I had in my head as I was watching Christian Grey in this movie. Hell, he made Anna look tough by comparison. And first of all, she rarely gets mad at anything. You know, throughout like the two hours in the movie, she only gets mad once and I think she only gets mad once in the whole trilogy. Oh my god. She only gets mad at him once in the whole trilogy. I just now realized that. So she never gets mad at anything. And second of all, in every second of this movie, every second of this whole trilogy, in fact, let me say, she sounds like as if she's constantly out of breath. Like she sprinted three miles. She's just now recovering from that like that's what she sounds like all the time and somehow some way she's tougher than christian gray in this movie before i go to kind of do the rest of my face i just want to say that what really hones in the hilarity of this movie is that i can see exactly what they were trying to go for I know exactly what they were trying to do. As I mentioned E.L. James's vision for Christian Grey, I know that they were trying to go for this sexy, intimidating, dominant man who will rock your world, who will like blow your mind of how sexy and intimidating he is. But like with this final nail in the coffin, they just like completely fell off the mark in their attempt to make him this like sexy dominant man that they were trying to go for. They just turned him into a 12 year old man child who has access to like a sex dungeon and i don't i don't know it's just they're it, it's <laughs> i don't even have words for it a few moments later so this is my final makeup look i hope you enjoy it i enjoy it it's been a while since i put a full beat face on but however you are not here to take a good look at my makeup you are here because you want to hear my final thoughts about the last movie of 50 shades of gray 50 shades freed now in my notes i did not write any final thoughts because mostly because this movie just baffles me. Baffles me to the point where I have no words to voice out my final opinion. Is this movie bad? Yes. Is this movie very exhausting to watch? Yes. Is this the worst Fifty Shades of Grey movie that I have ever seen? No, actually. Because the Psycho Stalker plotline is so prevalent and so in your face, it kind of makes this movie a little bit more bearable to watch. So I will say it's not as bad as the previous two movies, but it was definitely still bad. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying it's good. I would recommend you watch it if you appreciate the hilarity that I have seen in this movie. If you keep in mind the intentions of the creators, and maybe even the intentions of the author herself, and you watch this movie fail so badly to accomplish those intentions, I think you will find it absolutely hilarious. <laughs> hilarious is the only word I can come up with. So that is my conclusion on the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy. I hope you enjoyed this video and enjoyed the look that I have created along with it. Everything on my face will be listed down below. Subscribe to my channel if you like 
movie reviews and makeup and everything in between i have no problem with making random content and i will see you the next time i upload bye